This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Today's guest believes justice is something that all Christians should be an advocate for. Stephron James travels the world empowering men and women to take on the cause of justice and how it's an essential part of our faith. Micah 6 8, we've all heard it before, but we're going to get a new, new version of, of how this works in our lives and the truth of how it works in our lives. It says, He has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And with me today is Stephron James. And Stephron, this, uh, this truth of justice has really hit your life. You've written a book called Champions of Justice, broken that down into some segments so people can better get a hold of it. Tell me how that whole book came about. When I was come approaching, I'm 58 years old right now. You don't look it. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I'll be 59 this month. But when I was coming up on my 50th birthday, I was praying and asking God, God, I want my life to count for something. I want it to mean something. I want a legacy. I know we leave an inheritance for our children's children. But what about the impact of your kingdom? And the scripture you just read, which is amazing, yeah. is the scripture that I, I came across. I have showed the old man what is good Amen. and what does the Lord require. So I started there when I started. And I said, I don't know what this means. I have no idea what it what it entails. After I read that scripture, I started looking up word the word justice. And the next scripture I came across was in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 5. And this is what it says. It says, evil men do not understand justice, but those that seek the Lord understand it completely. And man, I sit there and went, oh my God, I have no, not, not only do I not understand it completely, I can't even tell you other than just a little base knowledge that justice has, is a part of the court system. I, I couldn't, yeah. as a man that had read the Bible through 20, 30 times, um, Given my memorized scripture, I couldn't define justice, and that staggered me. So I went back to try to define it and never got back to the point where I started. Yeah, I, I've, I've got to admit, too, when I, I read through these scriptures and I see the word justice, I think, okay, I know what that means, and I just keep on reading. And it, yes, really, sir. to understand what God says about justice is, is entirely different than what... Because you hear a lot about social justice warriors today, and I'm going to do yes, justice, and, and I want justice. Define all that. For, I mean, define what, what God is saying about justice. Well, one of the first things that I discovered is, like you said, one of the, uh, I always say it this way. The greatest place or the first place to ever begin to learn to grow is to re realize you're ignorant. Mm -hmm. And what I had to realize is I was ignorant where justice was yeah, concerned. I did too. And the first thing I had to come to terms with is that if I was going to learn anything about it, I couldn't let it be because I thought I knew what it was. I had to clear my mind of every idea, every place that I thought that and everything I thought about justice. And I just went to the scriptures. The first thing I discovered about was that how much the scriptures say about justice and then what specifically it said about it. Yeah. I started reading scriptures. You know, there's a law of first mention. The first time justice was mentioned in the Bible, it was mentioned in Genesis chapter 18, verse 19. But leading up to that, it was where God had came to, to Abraham when he was about to go down to Sodom and go more and destroy Lot. And he said this, he said, shall I keep from Abraham what I'm about to do? Of seeing he shall be the father of many nations and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Then it says this, I have chosen Abraham that I might, that he might, um, teach his children and his household following him to keep the way of justice that I might fulfill my promises I made to Abraham. Wait a minute. Did God just make Abraham teaching his, teaching his children and his household the way of justice? Did, did he just make the promise to Abraham contingent upon that? And that's the first time you also see the mention of the way of justice. 
And that's what God said. He said, when we teach our children and our households to do justice, God fulfills his promises to us. And that was the first time justice was mentioned in the Bible. And then we see it follow right throughout. And then you come to Deuteronomy in the 32nd chapter, verse 3. It says, I will proclaim the name of the Lord. I will ascribe greatness to our God. Then it says this in verse 4. The rock, his work is perfect. All of his ways are justice. Man, when I when I when I ran across the, you can't read something like that and not stop and go, okay, God, all right, all right, I, I'm willing to go back to kindergarten, put me back in preschool, and begin to teach is, me. Is that what is that what it did? As you started to write this book, think like, this is what God's got me writing this book for. This is the thing yes, that I've, sir. I've, not only do I have to learn it. I've got to put it down on paper so that so I can share it with 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 other people. Well, one of the things that I realized very quickly was that my understanding was justice was so limited. Now, what was that? Well, I mean, how did you how, how did you uh, because I know what I was thinking I, when I think justice, I think this, you know, was it the Supreme Court or or the court system or something like that or being fair with somebody? I always got fairness and justice kind of can. What did you really believe before you started this? What did you believe justice was? Did you have a definition? It's that's, hard to that's define. Very good, very good. Um, what, what struck me, as you can see by looking at the camera, I'm a black man. Yeah. And, and justice was being touted by so many people from so many different spheres. Like you said a minute ago, there were social justice warriors. Mm -hmm. There was these people, all these folks wearing bags, badges of justice saying, I'm going to do justice. I'm going to be a justice advocate. I'm going to promote justice. Well, what I started to see was, well, this person calls this justice and all they're doing is helping the poor. Well, this person calls this justice and they're carrying a picket sign. This person calls it justice and they're out tearing down buildings and, and breaking stuff. This person is calling it justice because they're going against the white man who is oppressing. I said, God, can all of this be justice? And what distinguishes one thing from the other? And so it led me on a journey to say, God, if I'm going to teach this, if I'm going to put it in a book, I've got to understand in a better way what this is. And what I began to uh, uncover is that everyone wants to call what they're doing justice. Uh -huh. But justice, by naming something justice, doesn't give you a nobility where you can say, I'm now good to go because I titled it justice. Yeah. And what I and I'll cover this here in a minute um, um, because there are some basics to it. But I have narrowed it down to justice in order for something to be labeled justice. It has to have three very, very distinct criteria. Justice has many characteristics, but criteria are a different thing. And if you fail to have any one of those three criteria, then you cannot label it justice, not justly. You cannot justly label it justice. Yeah, I want to ask you about that in a second. But I also want to ask you, uh, when, when, I, when I was thinking of justice, I think, okay, justice for the accused, justice for the oppressed, justice for someone else. But what you say in your book is that everyone, no matter who they are, deserves justice from each one of us. That we should, give, well, we should extend justice to everyone and everyone should extend justice to us. Well, my first basic principle or basic premise behind justice is this. Everyone on the face of the earth deserves justice, but not everyone is just. <laughs> Even when we believe or feel or, or contend that a person isn't just or is unjust, we still must deliver justice to that person. Because this is what it has to, has to happen. Your justice cannot be predicated on what another person does or do, does not do. And that's when we'll get to the criteria. Yeah. Because justice has to be blind, but it can never be deaf. It has to be blind, but it can never be deaf. 
It has to be blind to color, cause. It has to be blind to creed, clan, and culture. Because if we let those things dictate to us, then we miss the essence of what justice is about. Justice is about bringing people back into community or putting them in community or creating a dynamic where if someone is de demonstrating something that hurts the community, to handle them and have a disposition of them in a very just way. Well, it, uh, one of the things you, you look at with justice is when we're looking at the oppressed, that uh, they have, they've suffered a lot of injustice. What do you think God is, is, is so focused on justice in the Bible? Is it to end all oppression? Is it, uh, is it to uh, give everybody equity or equality? What, what do you think God has Ooh. placed in the Bible for? Now, you, you're really stirring the pot now. <laughs> uh, Good. <laughs> the, Bible say, but the Bible says in Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, mm -hmm. who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the enemy. And so what we find in this is justice first has to be a me initiative. Let, let me back up. Let me back up. Let me say it this okay. way. The first thing we have to recognize with justice is justice is not primarily a response. Justice is primarily an initiative. It's a foundational truth of God that he established his very character on. So what, and because, okay, I see you're asking questions. Yeah, I, I just wanted, okay, well, it, it's a response. Does that mean that I, I, I see oppression I can look the other way and go here, or I can see somebody that's being treated unjustly. I can look the other way and go here. But I, I've, it's, if I respond to it, I should actually have seen that before even, I mean, I should have initiated that even before my response. Yes. See, ju God wove justice into the fabric of human existence. Uh, it is an establishing force and a sustaining force. And I say it this way, any government, that is not founded on justice is doomed to failure, even self-government, even self-government. And because even George Washington said this, George Washington said the firmest pillar of any government is justice. Justice is the firmest pillar of any government. Dr. Martin Luther King said it this way. He said, if we're gonna have a living and, um, and successful uh, uh, humanity, the very thing we have to do is have, have disciplined nonconformists who have justice, peace, and brotherly and brotherhood as their foundation. Wow. So you see all of these people that were part of our founding of our country. They under, let me, let, let's go to this one. The preamble of the United States of America. We the people of the United States of America. In order to form a more perfect union, what do we do? Establish justice. justice. Amen. The first principle of any government is justice. Why? Because Cornel West, the philosopher and, and speaker and activist, I don't agree with everything he says, not much of what he says, but one thing he did say that was very profound and powerful. He said, remember, justice is what love looks like in public. When we show people justice, even if we don't have emotional connection with them, even if we don't have good feeling towards them, we can demonstrate the love of God. We can make them experience. And here's what, what else justice does. It returns hope to people in humanity, and it gives people again hope for humanity. I'll be back in a moment with more from Stefan James. Our culture is moving away from a biblically-based lifestyle faster than ever in history. Even many believers struggle to explain their own viewpoint on who Jesus really is. God says in the Old Testament that my people are destroyed by a lack of knowledge. That's why TV44 created Viewpoint with Bob Lacey, a program that discusses biblical issues and how they relate to our culture today. Now in our second season, Viewpoint is hitting more topics head-on than ever this year. 
Every Viewpoint program is produced without any commercial advertising, so no topics are off limits. But we couldn't do this show without the support of our financial partners. Maybe you've never supported a Christian media ministry before, but in today's world, our message is needed more than ever, and it only takes a minute to give. Go to WTLW.com and click Get Involved, then Donate. Your gift of $20, $50, or even $100 will help continue the outreach of TV44's Viewpoint program to impact your hometown and the world. We now rejoin my interview with author, speaker, and pastor, Stefan James. You know, I, I, when you look around society today, you look at almost any culture, and you, you, you see the level of, of the oppressed and the oppressor, and uh, people say, well, I'm going to do justice, and we hear about the wokeness, and, and now I'm woke to yeah. the, the oppression, and so I'm going to become a social justice warrior. You talked about three criteria. How do we judge justice? and whether justice is really happening. Okay. Well, the first thing, justice brings true stability, health, wealth, wholeness, and peace back to our communities and to the oppressed. But in order for us to do that, and here's my question to anyone, every, and I'm not a, a in-your-face kind of guy. I'm a pretty laid-back, easy-going guy. <laughs> But if you label something justice, I have just one simple question for you. Is your justice just? Then if you tell me it is, I will ask you, what criteria are you measuring it by? And that's usually when I get the deer in the headlights look. Yeah. Here's what I say and what I found from scripture. This was all, it's all there. I can show you book, chapter, and verse. In numerous places. The first criteria we have to have in order for, remember I'm saying criteria, not characteristics. There are many characteristics, but these are the criteria that God has established that there must be there. The first criteria is what we call established equity. And you ask that question. Mm -hmm. You ask me, you say, what's the difference between equity and inequality? The word equality is only found one time in the Bible. And it's not dealing with the equality like we're talking about. Equality, as we have defined it lately, is having equal opportunity and equal outcome. Well, you can provide equal opportunity, but outcomes are measured by too many different myriad and facets. Yeah. So what God looks for in criteria, and you'll find this in um, Psalms 99, verse number four, it says that you are to establish equity. Equity is this. Established equity is a predetermined way of thinking towards things. It is where you say, I will not enter into any situation or circumstance with bias or favoritism. I won't be biased towards my foes, those I'm fighting, those that are fools, those that are frivolous. <laughs> I won't be biased towards them. But it also says I won't show favoritism to my friends, my family, those I fancy, and those that are um, giving me favors. Mm -hmm. Just because somebody's giving you a favor, you cannot be taken away by that. Established equity means you have a predetermined way of approaching everything. So that's why justice is never a response. It's a order. It is a foundational principle of God. God said, I will build my foundation. Psalms 89, 14 says, righteousness and justice are the foundation of my throne. And then Psalms 9, 7 says, but the Lord sits in throne forever. He has established his throne for justice. So if he's established his throne for justice, if we're going to sit in any exalted position, what has to be our foundation? It has to be justice. The second criteria is this, an objective calibration. An objective calibration. I know yeah, that, that's yeah, a strange one. Well, I want to ask is you. Objective? Go ahead. On, on calibration, is it, is it something that, that's the same in, in every situation of justice, or does it vary depending on what we're dealing with. I mean, how do, when we calibrate something, we, it, it's usually calibrated to a standard 
and that standard doesn't change as it measures what's out there. That's so, calibration. But guess what? Hey, well, we do change. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. <laughs> and so an objective calibration means when I get ready to approach a situation, I'm going to calibrate myself back to the truth. And what the truth is, no ill will, no ill temper, mm -hmm. no Ill, Ill intent, no ill motive. You have good faith towards whoever you're approaching, regardless of who they are. And what you're saying is, I will have good faith towards the people I'm about to deal with. I like to say it like this, it's having clean hands and a pure heart. Mm -hmm. What you do is pure and your motive behind it is pure. Now, I said um, established equity was a predetermined way to think about a thing or to approach a thing without bias and favoritism. Well, here's what objective calibration is. It's a predetermined way to behave. You decide that you're gonna calibrate yourself back to the right way of behaving in a certain situation. So when you see people out there doing violence, um, I think it was um, Plato that said, um, violence kills what it's trying to create. And Pope John Paul said, uh, we'll never accomplish justice through violence. It will always um, backfire on it. And Stefan has come up with this one. Um, the way I look at it is when we uh, use uh, anything other than justice to bring about right and that it's rightly measured, then we ourselves become the biggest proponents of injustice. Mm -hmm. An impassioned cause is the greatest opportunity for injustice. An impassioned because cause. An impassioned cause is the greatest opportunity for injustice. Right. Because we believe we're right, we think we're right, but we don't measure our right. So we do we try to do right in the wrong way and become the unjust that are trying to bring about justice. So it could could that calibration point be if I can see righteousness and you're talking about right if, if we're saying, I, I want to, Lord, lead me in the path of, that I, have, um, I walk as a man with clean hands and a pure heart, lead me in yes, the sir. path of righteousness. Is righteousness a big part of that calibration? I like, I like that you brought that out. And that's why I intentionally stay away from that word. <laughs> because this message is not just to the church. This wow. message is to the world. Wow. Because even if a person isn't born again, but they can operate in justice, they will sooner or later run across somebody's path. If they have an established equity, a, a predetermined way of thinking, and if they have uh, an objective calibration, they pull themselves back to the center, then they will treat humanity in a better way. And at some point, I believe the light of God will shine on them and the other person. And they'll get to see it. So I don't I intentionally stay away from the word righteous because I don't want anybody to get that self-righteousness. Self but if you're willing to calibrate yourself, if you get up in the morning calibrating yourself to the right behaviors, no ill will, um, having good thoughts towards others, having treating everybody as the scripture says, as you want to be treated. If you have a predetermined way to behave towards people, they will experience God. Well, I know you, you. I know you probably work out every day. You're you were in the military for what twenty years, twenty eight years, something like that. Twenty two years. Yeah. Twenty two so years. Is this so, part of your morning routine when you get up and say, "I'm going to God. I'm I'm a human. I'm a man. I'm going to calibrate myself today." And, and you go back through that. You you do that on a regular basis. Every, I, I'm up at four between four and four thirty oh. every morning, and I these are. I'm, I, and I'll just say, just and this is just nothing. On Sunday mornings, every Sunday morning, I do a five-mile run, and I quote from memory every scripture on justice that there is. Wow! So God has really reached your heart on 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 the whole thing with justice. Yeah. Okay, we're we're into criteria one. We've looked at criteria two, calibration. Where are we with three then? Criteria number three probably is my favorite. It is what I call deductive truth. Deductive truth, not inductive, deductive truth. It's truth that welcomes scrutiny and interrogation. That welcomes scrutiny and interrogation. Truth cannot have a personal pronoun attached to it. 
It can't be his truth, her truth, their truth, yeah. uh, our truth. It has to be a definite article, the truth. And in order for truth to be established, you have to be very scrutinizing of wrong information, misinformation, and anything that would give you a wrong outlook on something. So truth has to be willing to be interrogated. If you get defensive when somebody asks you a question about the justice you're doing, then that this demonstrates that you are not standing on solid ground and foundation. So when somebody goes out and says, I'm, I'm doing justice, you can look at those three criteria. You can look at and I, I, I'll give you a good example. Okay. And this is no picking on anyone. I had a, a lady that was a Black Lives Matter advocate. And I, and I understand, I believe black lives matter. I believe all black lives matter. I believe not just the ones killed by police officers. I believe the ones that are, um, that are aborted. I believe the, one, the old people that are mistreated. I believe the teenagers that don't have a, a role model and a father figure and people in their lives. I believe the ones that don't um, have someone to help them with their illiteracy. I be, illiteracy. I believe all of them matter. But she was very militant, and I'm going for this, and I'm, um, and I said, let me ask you just, and I, do, I walked through it very simply. What are you measuring? I said, do you believe you're doing justly? Yes, I believe I'm doing justly. How do you know your justice is being done justly and rightly? Well, what do you mean? What are you measuring it by? Oh. I, I, but, but because I'm looking for the right results, who determines if those results are right? All I'm asking you is, are you willing to listen to three criteria to measure it by? And I walk through those three tri criteria with this person. At the end of that time, 45 minutes later, from militant, militancy to us hugging, and she said, I have to really look at all of this over again because I could possibly be destroying what I'm trying to create. Should, should justice that's what the criteria that's what the criteria do. They bring us back to center. They bring us back to balance. And here's what um, deductive truth is. Deductive truth is a predetermined way of speaking. So we got a predetermined way of thinking, a predetermined way of behaving, and then we got a predetermined way of speaking. I will not speak something as truth until I have studied it, interrogated it, questioned it, and made sure there's no misinformation with it. And I have to be open to that. And if you're willing to abide by those three criteria, then label what you're doing justice. It's our hope that Viewpoint encourages you to have the faith and knowledge to live an authentic life for Christ. As we do each week, I remind you that this show and the ministries of TV44 are supported by viewers just like you. So we'd appreciate your financial support. I'm Bob Placey, thanks for joining me.